Are you serious? Today we are going to talk about the M1 Abrams tank and we are going to take a look at the problems the tank had since the start and some that still persist in the latest variants. First one is of course the original M1. The tank officially entered service in 1981 and at the time it wasn't really good. It still had the old 105mm gun which was already starting to get obsolete. The performance of the gun was rather poor compared to Soviet 125 or German 120mm guns. Another problem is the engine. At the time, Germans have already developed a 1500 horsepower diesel engine, but because of reasons, US decided to go with a far more expensive gas turbine AGT 1500. Not only was it far, far more expensive than the German diesel, it also consumed a lot more fuel, which means that operating it was also more expensive. On top of that, the engine had a rather poor filtration system, but more on that later. Don't get me wrong, the mobility was excellent. But there is nothing that would justify the use of a gas turbine over a diesel with a similar power. <laughs> the commander's station in the tank was rather lacking. Unlike the Soviet tanks of the period, he could not override the turret. On top of that, he didn't even have a specific site for him, only had access to all-around periscopes, like on a Sherman, and a site for a remote machine gun which was not even stabilized unlike the Soviet one and had a rather poor magnification. Even the German Leopard 2, which the US tested prior to adopting the M1, had the commander's independent fully stabilized site which the commander could use to override the turret. The only thing the M1 commander could do when he notices a target through his vision blocks that were just that, they had no magnification or anything, he could take a look through the gunner primary sight extension and use a hand stick to rotate the turret just like the gunner would. And rotate the turret to the target he could have maybe spotted through his vision blocks. And that is it. In comparison, Soviet tank commanders at the time had their own sight which they could turn around, he had magnification and could override the turret to the target they would spot with their sight just like the Leopard 2. If you think that is problematic, wait till you hear this. The commander in M1 was completely blind during the night. Because he had no sight of his own, he could not look for targets during the night, and could only look through the gun sight extension in the thermal mode. In comparison, Soviet commander's sight had access to passive and active night vision sight, where he could search for targets even in the night. What? Need assistance! I can't hear you! It's too dark in here! Even the protection of the tank was lacking. When the tank entered service, soon there were already plans to increase the protection, because the Russian 125mm APFSDS of the time could have been able to penetrate its armor. That is when IPM-1 comes up, and the only difference between IPM-1 and M1 is the improved protection of the turret. That is it. It retained the same problems as the M1. M1A1 then came along and fixed the issue of firepower by introducing the 120mm gun. The firepower was improved, but Soviets at the time developed new monoblock projectiles that could have affected even the improved armor. So there were plans to put the depleted uranium in the armor, and so in 1989 M1A1HA came out with depleted uranium being put in the turret armor composition, which improved the protection. But the problem is that the hull received no upgrades whatsoever. It was still the same as on the original M1. Even if the hull was upgraded, the issue still persists. The problem with the hull armor design is that the upper front plate is only 38mm thick. And even though it is sloped, EPFSDS projectiles, especially monoblock ones, will have no trouble going through it. Even if they do bounce off by some miracle, they are launched directly into the turret ring and would penetrate it with no issues. No matter what happens, a hit there would end up penetrating the tank. Also, keep in mind that even though firepower and protection were improved, 
M1A1HA had no other issues fixed. The commander was still blind in the night and could not override the turret. And the engine still consumed a lot of fuel and had poor filtration system. This was especially a problem during Gulf War when the filters had to be cleaned every couple of hours. The reason for that is that the gas turbine sucked in a lot of air and simple filters, like the ones of Abrams at the time, weren't enough. The Swedes and the Soviets who had adopted gas turbine engines before the US had fixed the filtration problems from the start. Abrams is the only tank with a turbine that went around for over a decade with a poor filtration. And then M1A2 came along. It fixed a lot of issues. First and foremost, the commander was no longer blind during the night, and now got his own sight with thermal imager that he could use to override the turret. The filtration system was also fixed since both jet filters were installed which would automatically push the dirt out, which drastically improved the filtering issue. Of course, other problems still persisted. Over the years, the unstabilized remote machine gun was replaced with a stabilized weapon station on M1A2 or received the stabilization on M1A1 tanks. But the upper front plate problem was never fixed. According to Michael Green, M1A2 had 51mm thick upper front plate, but that is still not nearly enough. Not to mention that modern projectiles can go through it like hot knife through butter. The engine's fuel consumption is still much higher than any diesel engine. I know you probably think APU fixed the issue, but no, it did not. APU is there for the engine not to be used when the tank is idle, because gas turbine consumes as much fuel on idle as it does on the move. When the tank is moving, it still wastes a lot of fuel. Another argument for the gas turbine is that it's multi-fuel. Well, all diesel engines of modern tanks are multi-fuel. Yeah, they can't use the same amount of different fuel as the gas turbine can, but the question is, what's the point? The army will have diesel or gasoline or whatever fuel they use the most. The multi-fuel argument kinda becomes invalid when you realize that the army would take one type of fuel for the vehicles, because majority of ground vehicles do not use gas turbine engines. No one in their right mind would take specific fuel with them just so they could have it if they run out of diesel, just so they could use it on Abrams. No other vehicle, just Abrams, because Abrams is the only one with that ability. The problems of M1A1 Commander were somewhat fixed by the introduction of Stabilized Commander's Weapon Station on M1A1 SA variant, which is the latest one in use. It gave a thermal sight to the Commander and the ability to override the turret with a suit to Q option, thus making it perform similar role of CITV. But I don't know how good the actual thermal sight is on Stabilized Weapon Station, since the sight appears to be relatively small, thus I doubt its performance is as good as M1A2 CITV. But now another problem has appeared. Since Abrams has a munition compartment of a limited length, it is starting to meet the same fate as Russian tanks. And that is the fact that APF SES ammunition has already reached the peak length, even with MA29A3, since the new MA29A4 is of the comparable length. One way to fix this problem would be to introduce the L55 gun that the Germans are using on their Leopard 2A6 and 2A7 tanks or the new L55A1 with improved performance. Therefore, there is no need to solve the projectile length issue since the better gun would increase the performance of already existing projectiles. For example, the M63 fired by Leopard 2 tanks is shorter than the M829A3 fired by Abrams, but according to available information, it's a relatively comparable performance because it is fired from a longer gun. To sum it all up, when first appeared, M1 had unsatisfactory firepower and protection, for the long time, commanders suffered from the lack of night vision device and a stabilized heavy machine gun. The tank also suffered from poor filtration system. Although those issues are now fixed, the tank still suffers from a bad hull protection, especially because of extremely weak upper plate. Fuel consumption is really high compared to most of the other tanks, and the projectile length has already reached the peak, where the only hope is the installation of a new gun. That would be all. If you like my content, you can always support me on Patreon. Every bit helps and I would be really grateful. I hope you enjoyed the video and I will see you all in the next one. Have a nice day.